Go live. Okay, cool. We're going live. We're not revealing any state secrets. Uh, welcome everyone to Data on Kubernetes live stream number 70 something. All right, this is a student session, so it kind of fits in. We can call it 75.1, 75.2. We've got a lot of live streams going on this week, but this one is definitely going to be special. And it's not that I say that in every single one. Uh, we're the very special guest today. Uh, Logan Kilpatrick is no stranger to giving talks, is no stranger to innovation. And that being said, I just want to jump right in and start interacting with him. Logan, who are you and what are we going to be learning today? Uh, Bart, I'm really excited to be here. Really excited to, to get a chance to share more about the Julia programming language, which is which is why I'm here. Um, so right now I, I serve as the community manager for the Julia, the Julia program community as a whole. Um, and in that role, I, I get to do fun things like talk to people about Julia and and all sorts of, of cool things like that. And, and hopefully today folks walk away with sort of a better understanding of what is this nebulous programming language uh, called Julia? Why might I want to use it for, for my programming problems? Um, and also, what are some of the opportunities that that exists out there to actually go and contribute to the community? So I'm super excited. Very, very good. And can you just give us a little bit of background about yourself, about how you got started in computer science, perhaps some of the first programming languages that you learned when you got started, just a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, in, in some sense, I probably have a, a traditional entry point to computer science and that, you know, I took AP computer science in high school. Um, you know, I was sort of, I think, Flappy Bird. When I saw Flappy Bird come out and heard that the people who made Flappy Bird were making like $500,000 a day, I was like, wait a second, this is not how it should be. I can do that too. Um, and that was really my sort of jumping point. And I took AP computer science did terrible, got a one on the AP test, uh, was still sort of delusional. And I was like, you know, I can just, still just do everybody knows science. that the, the, AP, the AP test goes from one to five in terms of scoring. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> I did not, not do well on that it. So. But that's okay. <laughs> and it just shows that that's not the only way you can measure somebody's skills or interest or passion, right? Yeah, no, 100%. So I, I didn't do well on that and ended up going to I actually started uh, my college journey at community college. Uh, taking some C++ classes. And again, that was another really challenging sort of endeavor with my first like real programming experience being C++. And uh, I remember calling my family one day um, and I was like, hey, you know, maybe maybe computer science isn't for me. Like C++ is tough. Like pointers don't make any sense. I'm not sure why they didn't choose a different language paradigm. Um, but I, I made it through and uh, ended up getting involved in, in open source through uh, Google Code, in which if folks aren't familiar, it's a program that Google used to run for high school students. Mm -hmm. um, and I was a volunteer for that program for the, Ju the Julia community. And um, that sort of transcended and, and led to, to me becoming the community manager. So very much a, a full circle experience for me. Yeah. And also, can you tell us a little bit about, okay, so you got academic experience. You, you mentioned, you know, the non-traditional sort of routes there, or, you know, traditional sort of route into, into computer science. You're currently also studying something else, if I'm not wrong, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I finished up undergrad in computer science, decided to, to start my master's in uh, software engineering, but then also along the way, uh, through all this open source work that I've been involved in, um, decided that, hey, it might be good to actually understand the legal side of technology a little bit better. So I'm also a um, a graduate student at Northwestern's Pritzker School of Law, uh, doing my master's of science in law and specifically interested in intellectual property and, and all the implications for open source. So it, it, my first day was actually uh, Monday. So just really, really at the very beginning of that journey, um, but super excited to, to learn. I think that's great. And I think it's also just a nice testament. Like we get a lot of young folks out there and for all the young people who are attending today, is that don't feel that just because you're doing something when you're 20 means you're going to be doing the exact same thing when you're 30 or 40. This is, you know, it's a journey, it's a process, enjoy the ride. And also, as you see with tech is that, of course, you can do law and tech and you can mix those different things. And having had the previous experience that you've had, only going to make you stronger in that field because of the different perspectives that you bring to the table, the different experiences. Uh, so I think that's a really nice compliment to it as well. Now, Another place that you've stopped off and did a stint at was NASA. Can you tell us how did that happen? How did you get into that? What did you get from it? Uh, what can you share, uh, assuming that it's not confidential? Yeah, no, all this stuff at NASA able to talk about, which is super exciting. But um, I think the, the story there was, again, I, I was just 
interested in, you know, NASA is a cool place. I, I always, you know, I watched Apollo 13 like a million times when I was a kid. So I'm, I'm ready to become an astronaut and, um, and, and deal with those situations after watching the movie so many times. But um, yeah, I was really interested, had, had spent a lot of time when I was at community college applying for internships there. Uh, nothing had had really worked out for me. So I started reaching out to folks actually on LinkedIn. And I was like, hey, really, you know, I would find people who are specifically research scientists who are usually like leading a research group or something and would say, hey, really interested in the work that you're doing. Um, didn't have any success with that either until randomly someone like three months after I sent them a message responded and they were like, hey, uh, yeah, you know what, we'd, we'd love to talk to you. And uh, why don't you come in and, and we'll have a conversation went in and right there, they were like, yeah, we'd love to have you on board. Um, you know, here's the here's the offer to, to join this group. And, you know, a lot of a lot of luck involved in that situation. Um, but I think the, the the takeaway for folks is you have to put yourself in the position where you can get lucky, I think is the is the important piece. Like if I didn't reach out to those people, they weren't going to reach out to me. Like they weren't just going to be like, Hey Logan, come join us at NASA. Um, it, it really took the initiative to go and um, have those conversations. And then ultimately uh, that was the first team I was on at NASA. I left that team, joined a different team. And the second team I joined was uh, using Julia. And that's how I got started using oh, Julia. So okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really thankful for, for that opportunity as well. With that in mind, I think it's really cool you mentioned just because like a lot of times, you know, when we interact with young people that are very passionate, that are very energetic, and but sometimes you might say might be in a little bit of a hurry when it's in the sense of wanting to jumpstart their careers and getting into this stuff. I always try to say, you know, like Rome wasn't built in a day. These things take time. And as you said, there is always an element of luck, right? That's undeniable. But to what extent do we put ourselves in situations where Yes, there, there will be, a, you know, an element of luck, but there's a lot of other things, you know, that we can do that can sort of help create that luck. I think a lot of it as well, too, is in maybe you can comment on this more about what kind of uh, relationships that you establish with people and what were the kind of things that you were doing to make yourself visible so that they would keep you in mind to say, hey, Logan, we've got this opportunity. What were kind of the things that led into creating that luck? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I want to digress really quickly about like the, the you know, I just want to get to the point where I'm, um, you know, where I have that thing and instead of going through that journey. I think that's such an interesting observation. And it's, it's so true in the sense that, like, for me, interning at NASA, like, it was a it was a year plus long experience of me applying for you know the max number of internships that NASA would let me every single cycle for an entire year. When I you know did my internship at NASA uh, or at Apple actually, um, it was the course of you know two and a half years. I applied five hundred times, like over you know just this massive you know time investment for myself. And and I get these messages from people all the time. They're like. Hey, you know, I applied, you know, for one internship at Apple or one internship at NASA and I haven't heard anything back. What should I do? And, and my first reaction is always apply another 502 times and, and maybe things will work out. But again, the, the piece to consider is, and you just mentioned this, is what are you doing in the meantime? Like applying is, I think about it in the sense of um, at NASA, what I worked on was decision making under uncertainty. And, and one of the core principles in decision making under uncertainty is exploration versus exploitation. And I really think that um, you, you sort of have the exploitation, which is going and applying for these internships, going and applying for these jobs. But the exploration piece is, you know, how do you find the new opportunities? How do you make yourself better so that when it comes to the point where you're exploiting and you're applying, um, you have relevant skills? And I think that's really the balance between the two. You can't just sit around and apply for jobs all day, but you also can't just, you know, focus on learning all day. So you really have to find the balance that that makes sense for you. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think, but that's the thing is like, uh, that's the nature of being proactive. And like you said, combining, okay, so based on the projects that I'm working on, what kind of internships or jobs make sense given the skill sets that involve in that, as well as the people with whom I'm connected. I think uh, just what I want to say is uh, for a lot of folks that are out there is, uh, in the same thing of, I want to learn Kubernetes. It's going to take time. If you want to learn Kubernetes, jump in the CNCF, get in a SIG, start participating. There are going to be a lot of things that you're not going to understand. Don't worry. Everyone else who's learned Kubernetes has gone through the same process. So you're not alone. It's really helpful. And I've said this a million times. 
running into a community and started saying, I want to learn Kubernetes, you can do that, in which case we'll send you a very long list of resources and tell you to you know, go take a look at that. Google is your friend. Go to Google and type in whatever question you have. And luckily, with so many people in the world, somebody else has probably asked that question before. And if you're the first person, that's amazing. Um, but a little bit of homework, I think, goes a long way. So just encouraging people to, to be proactive, watch a video, listen to a podcast, read a blog. Really, the question is, is what's the best? How do you learn best in what kind of circumstances? So I just think there's a, there's a lot to be said for that. Also, in your case, you said you applied you know, 500 times. Does it mean that you failed 500 times? No, it means that it was a 500 step process in order to get that one acceptance. So I think there is, I think there's a lot to be said for that. You know, the, the consistency, the tenacity, don't take no for an answer. Um, don't be too hard on yourself, but always being proactive. I think that's really good. So what more specifically get, did you get to work on at NASA? Yeah, I, really quick, just one digression yeah. before we talk about what I worked on. I, I yeah. just want to say that also, folks, one of the most powerful things that you can do when you're applying for jobs or, or trying to figure out what the next step is for you is find some sort of small niche. If your goal is, you know, I want to be the, the expert in Kubernetes, that's great. And that might be a noble goal for you. And if that's really what you're excited about, you should go and do it. But again, looking at the size of the Kubernetes com community, you know, there's thousands and thousands of people. And if you want to become the expert in Kubernetes, you're competing against all of those people. And, and my advice is find the very, very specific thing that you would be interested in doing um, and, and go and do that. And also, you know, continually change and rescope and narrow down what that specific thing is. You know, for me, it was initially you know, I wanted to be a software engineer at, at some big tech company. And, and as over time, you know, that's refined and that's that's shaped and the goal has changed to the point where, you know, now I want to be, you know, the best community manager for the Julia language in the world. And it just so happens that, you know, I'm the only person who has that job. So I've, I've sort of accomplished that refined, very specific goal. And I would, again, just recommend folks to, to follow a similar path. The fewer people that you're competing against to, to get to whatever the end goal is, the better off you'll be. I think that's a great point. So everybody write that down. And, and what I see with that too is, you know, there are going to be lots of folks out there that, uh, you know, in terms of that are, that are certified or that have 10 years experience or things like that. But another thing that's really important to remember is not only is it, you know, that sometimes it's not the best technology that wins, but it sometimes it's not necessarily the most, you know, the person who has the most experience or the this or that. Also ask yourself alongside your technical skills, what kind of relationships are you developing? And, you know, what kind of people are you surrounding yourself with? You know, there's all these theories about, you know, that you are sort of the, the sum of the five people you spend the most time with, whether that's true or not. It, what is true is that if you generally interact with folks that are proactive, that will probably help you be proactive. You can kind of feed off that energy and, and be mutually beneficial. So once again, I think that's also where the, the power of community comes in is because like you said, you may not be the world expert on Kubernetes. But if you are very clearly identified in a niche that people realize we need that person on our team, then when these things come up in the future, whether it's a job opportunity, as you've experienced in, or in, in different places, or where, you know, it, it's like, well, there may be other people out there who are more qualified, but I know so and so and I trust them because we've been working in a SIG together or have shared, uh, you know, building things together. So those things, you know, in terms of how can you create an impact in that sort of niche area, as you, as you mentioned, is something that, and, and you're not going to find that overnight. That's going to take trial and error. You know, like you're going to, and generally you'll have to find by trying things that you may not like, and that's okay. They still make you a stronger, more robust, uh, self-healing, auto-scaling person, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think there is, I think there's really a lot, you know, the biggest risks, the biggest, I think, threat is, is inaction. Um, the main thing is be proactive, iterate on the go. Like I said, what, if I've learned anything from the Kubernetes ecosystem as well as the CNCF, um, being a nice person, paying it forward, having a positive attitude, those things will pay off huge, and whether it's short-term or, or, or long-term. Um, so that would definitely be my recommendation to young people. Anything, uh, so now can we talk a little bit about what you did at NASA? Yeah, I wish I could clip this conversation and, and pour it a little back through a time machine to myself uh, a few years ago. You know, it, it's hard to it's hard to hear the advice sometimes, depending on your your frame of mind. But I, I think that everything you just said, Bart, is is a hundred percent true. Um, 
talking about what I did at NASA. So again, yeah, I mentioned before that uh, the, the general project, and there's actually uh, internships open at the, the team that I was on at NASA. So if you, um, if folks are interested and, and they know a little bit about Julia and they know a, a little bit about uh, the decision-making under uncertainty space, uh, shoot me a message after this and I'll, I'll send you the link if, if you wanted to apply for this internship. Um, but yeah, so the team that I was on at NASA was helping develop decision support software for the NASA Viper mission, which is a upcoming lunar rover mission that's being sent to the moon in order to explore the potential of there being ice um, and, and ultimately, hopefully using that ice uh, to, to melt it and turn it into water. Um, so we, we were developing this system support software, this decision support software that uh, basically was going to help the rover, you know, make the right traverse on the moon. And this is a really complicated problem. And, and traditionally, what used to happen is you know, a bunch of experts at NASA would get together in a room, they'd pull up a map on a whiteboard and they'd be like, well, you know, this sort of seems like the right path that we might want to take. And they'd sort of draw it on there and they'd, you know, use whatever heuristic methods that they would to make sure that that seemed feasible. And then they'd go and do it. And that's what the, that's what the mission would entail. And um, obviously you can sort of start to think about, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in, in everything that happens in life, especially when you're on the moon and you're, you're controlling a lunar rover. So uh, this, this system helps to quantify some of that uncertainty. What do we not know? What do we know? How can we make you know, decisions in the real time moment that account for the uncertainty that have sort of the, you know, the plan B sort of built in and, um, and we can make an optimal decision based on the mission goals and really, you know, leveraging the, the computational power and efficiency of Julia to solve this really, really complicated problem, which is based on a, a POM DP, which is a partially observable Markov decision process, which again, you know, sounds complicated and fancy, which is fun, but uh, realistically, it's just a, or more simply rather, it's just a, a mathematical framework that helps model a real world environment and, and quantify some of the uncertainty associated with real world environments. So really interesting problem. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that I had was, you know, when I joined this team, I was coming from more of a pure computer science background. So didn't have any deep understanding of decision-making under uncertainty. Um, didn't have a deep understanding in the math that was associated with it. So I think that was really hard for me, uh, but sort of trying to, to leverage my computer science background to do as much as I could while I was on that team was, uh, was my goal the entire time. Okay. Wow. A couple of things here talking about uncertainty, you know, I think with the, the pandemic, we probably have more uncertainty than ever. Is there any plans to apply the Julia programming language to help us diminish the amount of uncertainty we're going through regarding COVID? Yeah, so it, it's actually been done already. So in really early on during the pandemic, um, folks were using Julia to actually do a bunch of the, the COVID models. Um, so there, there's a ton of uh, use cases for Julia in that sense, and, and it's already been done and, and continuing to be used for those for those models. Okay, so that's it's like, once again, it's not the the only you know sort of error we're seeing that where we're seeing this being applied. Um, now, and who exactly came up with the Julia programming language? Oh, by the way, I don't know if you have a deck or not, um, but if you need to start presenting something, go right ahead. But I'm just curious, like, well, who who was, you know, was there the eureka moment of we need another programming language and this is why? Yeah, no, that's great. I, I do have a deck bar, but yeah, I yeah. also enjoy, I enjoy the conversation. Cool, 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 good. So, yeah, no, because I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, you know, steal your thunder if you've got like a big slide no. in the camera on that. <laughs> No, I, I appreciate it. I, I can share the deck. I'm also happy to just talk. I think it's uh, it's fun to have a conversation instead cool. of, yeah, either one I, I can share though. Um, but yeah, so Julia, the folks who created Julia, you know, were using some of these other uh, traditional technical computing tools back in 2012, MATLAB, R. Um, and again, the challenge that, that they have and, and the challenge that folks still have today is, you know, you take a language like MATLAB, you take a language like R, when you get to the point where you need to solve a problem um, computationally quickly, um, or perhaps you're you're looking at you know some math uh, like written down on a piece of paper, and then you're like, okay, how do I translate that into the actual code so that I can solve this this 
technical problem. Um, you know, the existing tools don't do a good job of that. MATLAB are, in my opinion, uh, Python sometimes don't do a good job of, of mapping the math to the code. And also from a computational uh, efficiency standpoint, you know, running the code quickly. Um, so what folks used to do and what folks still do today is they, they do their prototyping in a language like Python, um, get to the point where the code actually works. And then when they wanna go and deploy it in a production setting, they rewrite everything uh, in C++. And this is, if folks have heard of the two language problem, uh, this is the fundamental two language problem where, you know, the, the initial language doesn't have enough speed to make it into production. So you have to write your code twice. And, and Julia really was set out to solve of this um, and the folks who created Julia back in 2012 um, joined MIT to sort of help incubate this language and then ultimately broke off and um, created the open source project and, and created a actual separately a commercial entity to, to help uh, businesses leverage Julia as well. Wow. And uh, off the top of your head, do you know which what kind of businesses were the first ones, you know, early adopters to say, hey, we think this matches our, you know, our use case and we think it can add some value? Yeah, I think some of the initial folks were were around um, finance. Right now, it's uh, it's finance. Yeah, it's uh, um, climate modeling is really exciting. Pharmaceutical companies are huge. All the folks, um, and and we can talk more about it later. But um, you know, Moderna, Pfizer are heavy users of Julia specifically for their vaccine um, and drug development discovery groups. Uh, so lots of super incredible work. I think the the one at um, the team at Pfizer, I think there's a there's a blog post about it. It was something like uh, like a ten thousand x speed improvement over their MATLAB simulations when they switched to Julia. Um, and you know you can think about you know in the context of COVID, you know the the speed was incredible. They were able to solve. I, I think I read this somewhere. It was like they had the vaccine in its entirety, like sequenced and completed in like two days after they received the initial information. And then all of that huge time delay that we sort of felt um, on our side was them going through the vaccine trials and making sure that it was safe and effective. But really the vaccine was developed in two days and then it just took them nine months to validate that work, which is just absolutely crazy to think about. Um, but yeah, very, very interesting. And, and that's sort of the, the use cases today. That's great. And it, you know, it just goes to show because sometimes it might seem that what's being done with computer science or other programming languages is just happening behind closed doors or it's just a GitHub repo. Folks, we're talking about things that are literally impacting us right now as we speak and, and things that we're interacting with every day in the news and perhaps might not realize that what's going on in this case with the Julia programming language is having a direct influence on the very things that are, are, are shaping you know, the discourse around, uh, around COVID. And, and also a lot of folks that have asked, you know, that about how, you know, the vaccine development has been, you know, unprecedented in terms of how fast it's been. And I imagine that these are some of the factors that, that, are, that are playing a, a very significant role. Obviously, this is a very unique set of circumstances in many ways. Um, but, you know, once we sort of, you know, get behind the scenes or get under the hood, as I often say in tech, uh, to see what it is that's actually allowing these things to happen at the speed at which they're, they're taking place. We got a couple of questions here in, in, in the chat that I want to get to. So one question from uh, Ravi. Thank you, Ravi. Um, what's the objective behind creating CXX.JL, which is a C++ wrapper? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Ravi. So one of the, and, and I'm not sure that this is sort of <laughs> advertised anywhere as a core principle, but to me, for a programming language that's being developed right now, given the sort of landscape, you know, there's a ton of great things out there. C++ is great. Python is great. R is great. MATLAB is great. Again, I, I know that I was talking before about, you know, Julia might be better suited in some cases, but really those languages have done a good job. That's the reason why they're popular. Um, so one of the really important parts about Julia as a language is the notion of interoperability. Um, and that word is difficult to say, but the general sense is that, you know, given that I have this Julia code on my computer, how can I have that code interact 
with other languages. Um, and interoperability means that I can take our code, I can put it right inside of my Julia file and I can run it and I can have R just work. I can have an R script basically embedded inside. Same with Python, same with uh, C++, all of those things. Um, and again, what that means is that, you know, let's say you have some really kick butt C++ code in the case of CXX.jl that you've written and you're like, I have no interest in rewriting this in a separate language, but hey, there's actually some additional components in Julia that I could sort of build on top of uh, that C++ code. Go ahead and put it right into your Julia file, run it, and then you're good to go. Um, so I, I think that's such a cool feature and it's it's something that is you know, widely used across Julia and, and also other languages. If you're familiar with um, with Python in the context of a lot of the machine learning packages, most of the machine learning packages in Python, like if you look at PyTorch, the actual uh, repo itself, it's like 5% Python. And I'm just pulling these numbers out of thin air. So these could be the wrong numbers, but it's, it's minimal Python. And what PyTorch actually is, is a C++ machine learning package that they put a wrapper of Python on top of so that people are comfortable using it. Um, and, and Julia is, you know, again, designed from the ground up to be the opposite. Julia's machine learning package is 100% Julia, but if you had some C++ code that you written uh, or wanted to bring over from, Py from PyTorch, you could do that using cxx.jl. Okay, very, very good. Got another question, this one from Tim. Thank you, Tim. Does embedding other code inside Julia also provide some sort of speed up or optimization? Good question. Um, generally, I would say no. Uh, so you're not like, if that was the case, that would be really interesting. And then everybody would just would just put their other code inside of Julia to speed it up. But, but unfortunately, um, that, that it doesn't really provide that much of a speed up. And again, why that's the case is because you're, you're not really, when you embed that code inside of a Julia file, you basically have a Julia process that starts on your computer. Um, and then that Julia process sort of makes a call to C++ or makes a call to Python. Um, so you're still running Python in the back end. It's just sort of being uh, layered using Julia. Julia is taking care of making sure that that code is running um, and then getting the output of it. So it's not fundamentally improving the speed of that uh, of that original language that you had. That's a good question though. All right. Um, thanks Tim for the question. Another thing as well too, and because you kind of touched on this is, you know, obviously there are people, you know, can fall in love with one programming language or another. Some people can switch, some people don't want to switch. Uh, you know, in terms of the challenges that you have, because at the end of the day, you know, there does have to be a little bit of marketing and you in the role of community manager. What do you what do you do or what have been, you know, things that have added to the success of the growth of the Julia programming language, you know, in, in the sense of getting the word out and getting people you know, excited about this programming language? And what have been some of the challenges of, of achieving that goal? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think you know, some of the challenges and, and also where we've had success sort of fall into the same line. I think what one of the, the big sort of, again, the big sort of reason that folks might want to use Julia is for things that are in the technical computing space. And, and that's vague and sort of ambiguous. But if you look at it more uh, very specifically, it's areas uh, of basically science. Uh, like if you're doing, you know, pharmaceutical stuff, if you're doing math stuff, if you're a biologist, if you're, you know, whatever this, the area of a physicist, um, Julia is very well suited for those areas. Um, and, you know, you see widespread adoption in those areas. And, and again, the challenge that we've had is, you know, those are oftentimes the areas where people are getting really excited and there's all these super cool use cases. But fundamentally, Julia is a general purpose programming language. It just so happens that, you know, where the most interesting, and exciting things tend to happen is, you know, around some of those areas. But again, you can use Julia for web development. You can use Julia to, you know, go and go and scrape some website and, and do interesting things like that. Um, so I think our, our challenge right now is we have all this really cool technical computing stuff. Um, 
But, you know, again, thinking in the context of even like a student learning a, a programming language, you know, when I learned C++, like I was building a calculator or like a banking application, like I wasn't building like, you know, modeling COVID spread in the United States or something like that, that that's like a little bit higher level um, yeah. to me. So I think our challenge right now is how can we, you know, make a compelling use case and, and things like that for people who aren't you know, deep domain experts. I do think though that using those examples and, and uh, climate modeling is a really interesting one. You know, people, students, young people uh, in general are very aware of the problem of climate change. Like we all know that it's going to happen and we're sitting there thinking we're kind of screwed. So um, for me, I'm, I'm really excited about Julia's use in the climate modeling space, because I think it's such a relevant example for everybody. And um, my hope is that in the next, you know, two to three years, we can really make Julia sort of the language for understanding climate change. Um, and that's something that there's a lot of cool work happening in that space. But again, we, we need to do a good job of making it so that there's entry level materials for people so that, hey, I, I don't, I'm not a climate scientist, but you know, maybe I want to take a stab at, at solving this one particular problem or modeling some of the stuff that's happening, you know, in my local city using Julia. How can I do that? Um, I think that'll be a really cool and interesting opportunity. Definitely. And, and what that is, you know, it's interesting what you said in terms of, you know, thinking about your target market or, you know, segmenting, you know, who's going to interact with Julia the best. It's been, you know, in the last, I would say, five years, seeing a lot more folks enter in the data science space that came from a, let's say, more traditional science background, like you were mentioning, uh, whether it's physicists or pharma, people working in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, folks that are that are doing climate climate uh, change research, are realizing that you don't have to be a programmer, you know, to get into programming, and you know that this can actually provide a significant advantage. I imagine that we're only going to be seeing more people moving into that. I mean, even even historians that are using you know machine learning, uh, whether it's scanning documents or lots of different things that are going on there. I think it's exciting to see different profiles getting into a space that previously seemed maybe more exclusive, just for folks that were studying computer science and IT. What I'm curious to what that in mind is. Let's say you have a physicist, what or, or a physicist or not, as someone who's new to Julia programming language that and maybe doesn't have a lot of experience programming uh, in other areas. What are the first steps that you generally recommend that they take? Yeah, that's a, again, it's a really good question. I, I do think it depends on sort of folks background, like what what might get a physicist excited, it might be different from what um, a student is excited about, perhaps in some cases, but mm -hmm. I I think, you know, for the for the physicist, looking at the math um, and looking at how similar the math is to the Julia code, I think is what gets a lot of those people excited. Um, like it, you hold the two things next to each other and you're like, wait a second, I actually see what's happening here. And if you look at like a, a, a piece of Python code and you look at the math, you're like, this is literally not the same thing. Like the words might be similar, but like it's just fundamentally doesn't look the same. Um, so I think that's one piece. But I, I really believe that the, the first First step for people should be looking at what the learning resources are. Um, uh, you know, on the Julia Language website, we have a bunch of those resources posted, um, and we've tried to do it in a way that sort of caters to everyone's different learning style. So if you're, you know, a student and you spent the last two or three years, you know, taking university classes, and, and that's sort of the frame of mind that you're in with your learning, you know, we have those you know, university classes, there's an MIT class, uh, introduction to computational thinking that's free and open to the world and um, has a bunch of incredibly good lectures. And you can go in and watch those and learn Julia. Um, again, if you're someone who's like, you know, school's not my thing. I, I don't want to be part of that. I really just want to go and solve problems and, um, you know, maybe have someone there to help me. Uh, we're on this platform called exorcism.io. Um, and it's an interesting name, but uh, the platform is basically designed to help people solve problems and have an actual mentor, a domain expert, uh, help you and provide feedback on those exercises. So you can go on there solve Julia problems and, and somebody, it might be me, it might be someone else will actually comment and be like, Hey, here's how you can write better Julia code, um, just based on the, the submissions that you make. So that's a really cool platform. Again, there's a bunch of other ways that you can do it. So I would suggest folks go to the Julia language website, see what makes sense for them. Um, but there's a, there's a ton of options. Great stuff. 
Um, I, I just I just shared the link with uh, to, to exorcism here, so that once again, if folks want to get hands on practical experience, they can do so. And then in your role, you know, as community community manager, just because this is an interesting thing as well too, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about what community management involves. What is for one person isn't the same as this for another. What are the things that are involved in your role on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, what kind of stuff do you find yourself? What are your, your the tasks that you're focused on? Your objectives? What what is what is a day in the life of a community manager at, uh, at Julia Programming Language? Yeah, this is an excellent question. I think it you know something that has kept me engaged. Um, for the last year and a half plus has just been how different it always is. Like, you know, there's a few sort of guiding principles that I, or a, a few guiding like tasks, if you will, that I've been continually doing for the last year and a half, but really it's all over the, all over the place. So, you know, one aspect of it is, you know, our student programs, helping students who are going through Google Summer of Code, uh, our technical writers through Google Season of Docs, um, some of the other peripheral programs associated with that. So helping run that, um, focusing on our educational initiatives. So we have a platform called Julia Academy, which is where people can go and learn Julia or other domain specific things like uh, modeling the COVID pandemic using Julia. We have a course on that for free um, on Julia Academy through MIT. So you, folks are welcome to take that if they're interested. Um, doing social media stuff. I, really, it's you know, something that's interesting when you look at large open source projects, and this is something that I've tried to do a better job of, of advocating to students over the last year and a half, you know, if you're involved in an open source project and open source community, try to get a sense of, of where the gaps are. And I think, you know, in, in a certain sense, the Kubernetes community has done an incredible job of structuring things such that it is, you know, the entry points are super clear. Like there's SIGs, there's, you know, the shadowing program, all these yeah. awesome initiatives. Um, so I think they've they've done a good job of making it so that students don't have to identify these things themselves. They're just there already. And if you're interested, you can sort of just hop in um, and it's perfect. I think in the Julia community, we we haven't done that because we're not, <laughs> we're nowhere near in the same place as the Kubernetes community is. So, um, you know, students, and, and people have to do a little bit more of the legwork themselves to identify those gaps. But really just looking at the open source project, seeing where the sort of administrative, logistical, uh, educational gaps are in the ecosystem, and then going and just taking the initiative and helping solve those things is how that, that's what I spend my time doing right now. Like I just go and, you know, if it's a, if it's a more technical focused day, I, I go and look at the machine learning packages, um, you know, make sure that they all have their documentation being deployed. If they don't, I spend a little bit of time helping fix up the documentation, getting that resolved. Um, you know, some days it's, you know, doing social media stuff to make sure that that people hear about Julia so that all the hard work that we're doing doesn't go to waste. But um, it, it's really all over the place. And, and that's why I enjoy it so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's never, never a dull day. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine <laughs> that. Um, and I guess that's the other thing as well, too, is that in terms of the, the folks that are making up the core team of the Julia programming language, how many people are we talking about? Core team is a difficult, is, is difficult to define. I think, you know, this is something that I find so interesting about, like, I'm the only person who is uh, financially compensated for my time through the Julia language to do stuff for the project. Um, everybody else is, is a volunteer who's just doing, you know, doing this out of the goodness of their heart. Um, so it, it's a, it's interesting. Like there's a ton of core contributors. A lot of the core contributors uh, work at a company called Julia Computing, which again is where all the co-founders and creators of the Julia language work. Um, and again, they they realize that, hey, we actually need a business that is going to pay us money so that we can continue doing all this awesome work that we're doing. So it, it makes perfect sense. So I collaborate a lot with those folks. Um, but in general, uh, I think the community is so organic right now. It's awesome. Uh, and And there's not really this really structured uh, piece, which can be kind of scary, but I think it just means that there's a lot of opportunities for people to come in um, and sort of fill some of these gaps that exist. Yeah. I think it's just interesting to hear that though, from you that, you know, you look at Twitter and I think you've got around, you know, 20,000 followers, you know, so you, there are many companies with huge budgets that have, you know, not, not even half that. 
uh, I think it's just interesting to see the, the power of, of volunteers and that when you create a space where people get excited about something, it's, you know, like the field of dreams quote, if you build it, they will come. Uh, Kubernetes CNCF is no exception, being huge initiatives that really don't have that many people that are really, you know, uh, you know full-time employees or that are being compensated. So I think that's interesting to see as well, the, the, the power that's there when, when people can really latch onto something and see the impact that it's having and, and the sort of, let's see, uh, you know, I don't want to say promises, but I'm saying the outlook of things that they can see uh, in the future and in the present of what you're talking about earlier, about directly seeing the impacts on things like COVID. Now, I have read a few things about Julia programming language and Kubernetes. Could you tell me a little bit about how those two are interacting and what stuff's going on there? Yeah, that's another really great question. So um, this is something that, you know, I, I'll, I'll make my initial disclaimer. I'm not a Kubernetes expert, um, but one of the, the cool things, in my opinion, about what Kubernetes allows people to do is, is sort of scale up that, that workflow that they have um, on the cloud. And that's, again, when you think about some of the projects that Julia is being used to solve, it's these you know, and I have a, a, a few slides or I'll just actually direct folks to the website, like this project called Klima at Caltech, um, C-L-I-M-A. Uh, they're building a, a climate model, um, which is the hope is they can actually model the entire earth accurately with, with this climate model. And, and that's a really difficult computational task. And you can sort of start to think about, okay, what are the, what are the cloud technology pieces that I would need if I was going to go and solve that problem? And, and you can automatically start to see how Kubernetes slots right in um, to, to helping solve a problem like that, or some of these other massive scale problems, you know, having your, um, having the speed of the program programming language is just one piece of that. You need that programming language to scale up on the cloud. Um, so there's a there's a Julia package called, um, fun, the name is kind of funny, it's called Kuber, uh, K-U-B-E-R, uh, which I actually really like. It's my favorite my favorite name package that I've seen recently, kuber.jl, um, is the Julia interface to Kubernetes. So if you if you look up kuber.jl, you can, you can see what that interface looks like. It's a, again, a very simple API. Um, so you can, you know, spin up everything that you would need for a, for a cluster and um, again, continue to scale your workflow as you're solving these more complicated problems. Um, Kuber.jl is, is there to be part of that solution, which I think is incredible. Do you think that because of it being a newer programming language that it's easier for it to be more flexible and we can call Kubernetes native compared to other programming languages? Any connection there? It's a good question. I'm not sure if I know if I have a good answer though. I, I mean, yeah, I don't know. That's a no, good no, question. No, it's fine. It's fine. No, I, I just, just curious. It's, I say that, you know, generally it's not so much a programming language thing or, you know, when we talk about databases, you know, do you have to sort of shoehorn these things into Kubernetes as opposed to newer ones that will boast of being, you know, Kubernetes native. So they've taken that infrastructure into account, whereas other, you know, other technologies, you kind of have to tweak them a little bit to get them to, you know, mesh and, and gel with, uh, with Kubernetes. Anyway, that's fine. Other things I want to, you know, that we're that we're kind of curious about, it, it, you having a background in machine learning um, and, and and working on things of this nature, what are the things that you see going on in Kubernetes right now that make you excited about what lies ahead in the future? That's another good one. I think, truthfully, my my exposure to Kubernetes has been more as a as a student of what the Kubernetes community is doing. Ah. I think that has fascinated me a ton from the from the community side, and I know some of the folks um, th that I that I work with and have seen the work that they're doing and and the structure of the community and the way that those things are happening. But one thing that I'll point out: the fact that the the Kubernetes community has an open Slack workspace that has like a hundred thousand people or something like that. And I was sitting there, I was like, how is that possible? How, how have they not broken Slack yet? Um, and it also, I think that's a, that's a paid, that's a premium Slack workspace. I'm pretty sure. I don't, I don't know if that's a hundred percent true, but um, you know, just, just observing all of these pieces of the Kubernetes community, I think from a, you know, taking a step back, for open source as a whole, I think the the combination of the way that the the SIGs are happening in Kubernetes, the way that the shadowing program, all of these 
internships and and sort of also the additional it's so interesting to see in the kubernetes community all these additional layers that have been built on top of kubernetes um, the different sort of ecosystems and and communities um like the data on kubernetes community like that like part of the the kubernetes community but also like its own separate community i think that's that's so interesting um and again my hope is that other open source projects, including Julia, but also, you know, all these other projects that exist can sort of model off of the success that Kubernetes had, because again, speaking objectively, tremendous amount of success for the Kubernetes community, like clearly one of the, the largest, um, most well-funded open source projects uh, and, and infrastructure pieces that exist in, in technology right now. Like I can't think of a of a better example. Um, so I'm really excited about that and, and seeing where other organizations, other open source communities model some of these pieces. And, and I, I think you're starting to see that. Like, I think the, the Python Software Foundation um, is starting to, and I actually could have it reverse, maybe Kubernetes copy them or vice versa. I'm not 100% sure on the history, but you're starting to see some of these other ones like build in these shadowing programs. You know, you can join the release team for Python if you want to um, and be part of that experience. I think those are, again, from a also from a diversity and inclusion standpoint um, in open source, which is a huge challenge. I think those are such important things to have. Um, so it, it's super exciting. I'm again, yeah. I'm a student of the community, and I and I love it. No, but I think that's it. I think there's a lot to be said for that. And once again, as much as we can talk about the technical aspects, is like I said, is that if you, I think one of the very successful things about Kubernetes, and as well as like you said, some other open source projects too. I guess that's always interesting as well when we talk about KubeCon. It's KubeCon, but also Cloud Native Con. Yeah, there are other projects that are not Kubernetes in, in the Cloud Native, um, in the CNCF landscape. But uh, I think what's what's really important there is that for any community to work, there has to be trust, there has to be transparency, there have to be opportunities. And I think the Kubernetes community does a very good job of providing all those. Thinking about that, because you were mentioning about, you know, uh, was it, you know, Python first or was it Kubernetes? Regardless of that, as a community manager, uh, and just so everybody knows, being a community manager, in my opinion, involves a lot of suffering because you're always thinking, I'm not doing this well enough. I could be, and you look at your competitors, you're like, oh, I wish I could do that or this or that. <laughs> if, if there's one thing that you could add more to the Julia community, what would it be? I think from a, and, and we just mentioned it a little bit, but I think all of those working groups and the mentorship for students there is incredible. I think in the Julia community right now, we have a bunch of incredibly smart people who are, you know, busting their butt and, and really stretched thin on time. And that's really the limiting factor right now. Like, I, I think it's it's not that there's not this desire to have these opportunities for, for students to come in and observe, okay, how does the release cycle for Julia work? You know, what is, you know, what's the compiler team within the Julia community working on? Um, it's really the the time limiting factor. And I need to spend some time talking to the Kubernetes people like how do I'm sure they're in the same boat. I'm sure they're also super busy. Um, so maybe it's the structure of the program itself that, you know, is minimal overhead for those core team members. Um, and I just haven't looked into it in enough detail to know the answer to that. But really, I, I, I want that so badly. I want students to be able to come in or anyone to be able to come in and observe some of these core Julia pieces that are taking place. Because even for myself, being involved in the community, being involved in the language, like, I don't know how these things work. I don't know, you know, the details of the release cycle for Julia, just because, you know, I, I personally haven't had the time to invest in it. But also, I think the people who are doing those things um, are, are super stretched thin. So I, I really would love to see that in the next year, um, some of those mentorship programs coming about so that we can make it a more diverse and equitable uh, ecosystem for everybody. And again, I, I love that the Kubernetes community has done such a good job of that. No, I think, I think it's, I think it's a great point. And one of the, and this is something that we get a lot of questions. I get, we get the, this question a lot. Um, I mean, just this week, I've probably answered it two or three times from young people. What are the prerequisites to get involved? How can I start contributing all that kind of stuff? And that's one of the things that I'm very passionate about in the Kubernetes community is contributor experience, making it really easy for folks to get involved. And then also doing the storytelling of how different people have arrived and the different contributions that they're making. You know, one of the things that often gets mentioned in, uh, you know, contributor experience panels is reviewing documentation and looking for typos is a huge contribution. I always say just having a positive attitude is a huge contribution 
We're talking about uncertainty and pandemics and difficulties and challenges and frustrations and fears that we're all going through right now. Being a friendly person goes a really long way and there are lots of ways to be friendly. Um, so those are good things too. But one of the things that's very typical in the SIGs is having you know beginner issues, uh, first time issues um, so that you don't need to feel like you're tackling a big hairy monster that's gonna totally overwhelm you. Is how can you have more bite size experiences so you can get a feel for it and then mediate or measure what's that time commitment gonna look like? Because in my personal experience, Every time I get committed to something, it almost always involves more time than I expected. So just anticipating, you know, anticipating that there's also a learning curve and you can only be involved in so many things at the same time. So how can that be sort of divided up into um, experiences that can be, what well, we often tell people for our Kubernetes, SIG commitment, one hour a week. You don't even have to say anything in the meeting. Just be there and listen and, and say hello and welcome people. Like that's more than enough. And it, maybe it's gonna take three or four SIG meetings and reading the documentation before you get up to speed. But I think that's definitely something that the Kubernetes community has done well. However, I would imagine that there are other communities out there that are doing you know, similar practices. So I think that it's kind of a, it's a learning journey based on the folks that you're trying to get involved. As you said as well with Julia, it's not just seasoned practitioners. It's not just folks at MIT. How can students that are you know, looking to have an open source experience, how can they sort of jump in there too? But like I said, I yeah. think, you know, that's a, that's a process, you know, like that's, it's not something just, and, and I think the CNCF and, you know, the Kubernetes community has learned a lot from uh, successes and we can say learning opportunities that, that the Linux foundation has gone through. So, you know, it's a very long history of, you know, trial and error. Um, but I think these are the things that make, make community exciting. And just in the case of Julia, how many people are we talking about? How many countries off the top of your head, do you know? Yeah. So I think, a million plus developers total, but also at the most recent JuliaCon, which is our, our sort of annual conference, which I usually is a gauge for like how many of those people are, are perhaps like actively engaged in the community. It was uh, around 50,000. Um, and then, you know, there's there's other levels of as, as far as engagement goes. But yeah, it's, you know, doubling in size every year, which is just crazy to think about. I'm like, lots of work, <laughs> lots of work to get done. So it's a, it's, it's an exciting time. Also going back really quick, Bart, to what you yeah. were saying about the, um, you know, the time commitment for some of these things. I, I've been really interested in if folks haven't read this book before, even for yourself, Bart, um, it's called People Powered by um, John O'Bacon, who is oh, yes. formerly... Oh, yes. Yeah, the, the head of community at, at GitHub and such an incredible book. And, and one of the interesting things that he talks about in that book is um, the arc of a contributor. And I think one of the things that people get wrong about open source is, is thinking that, you know, step one <clears throat> for your open source journey is, is looking at, you know, good first issues or, you know, whatever it is on GitHub and just going and solving that. To me, that's like step seven. Like you're, there's so many things that you can do before you get to that point. So don't think, you know, I've done this even for me every single time. I'm like, someone says something is a good first issue. I go and look at it and I'm like, wait a second. I'm not sure that this is, <laughs> this is really a good first issue. I don't yeah, think this is, it's, sort of... it's, yeah, it's the first issue after you've done your second and third, right? You know, that, exactly. That, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I think just being conscious of that, even as a contributor, like go and write a blog post, go and attend a SIG meeting and, and just hear some of the vernacular that people are using and all of those things, do those all before you feel like you have to go and, and tackle a, an issue on GitHub. I, I really think that there's just Agreed. so many more. Yeah. There's so many more things to do before you get to that. And, and it's, it's not a competition and no one's got a gun to your head. You know, like that's, if, <laughs> if, there's, you know, if there's anything that can be understood once again, cause this is all, you know, volunteer driven people are doing this in their free time and it should be something that should be enjoyable. Not something where you feel like uh, you know, that you're just having to grind it out. Like, yeah, you may have to make some time or whatever. And, and if you want, you know, great experience, check out the, uh, the recent podcast interviewing Savitha, who was a release manager for Kubernetes. You know, she's, she's been doing this balancing all with a very, you know, very full-time job. And, uh, but, you know, and it's like dele delegate, defer, and I forget what the other D is, but like do delegate and defer. Like the things that you can't do, you know, delegate them. And if it's really not important, defer and have it done later. Um, so I think that's a really, really good point. And I think that's kind of, our jobs of people that are leading communities is to make that journey, that onboarding process easier. And that's something that I think can still actually and is being improved in the Kubernetes community in the CNCF because now we're getting more and more young people 
which is amazing, that have a lot of energy, but it's our job to make it easy for them so that we don't have a, a you know a high bounce rate if we want to use you know Google Analytics terms of folks entering and then just getting out because they're like, you know what, I tried it, but nothing made sense. And I've, no one wants to feel stupid. You know, like that's, that's yeah. the universal thing. Um, so how can we break things down so that it's like, so that you feel like you're making progress and you feel like, oh, I'm getting somewhere. Like I, and like you said, the, the jargon, the terminology, you know, there's now a uh, cloud native glossary, which is a very nice initiative. It's only going to be growing in our community. We're working on a visual learning dictionary and vocabulary words, because we know that Someone comes in for the first time and you start talking about uh, ingress, envoy, uh, you, you know, you name it. And, you know, and all the other things, uh, CSI and uh, C, uh, CRD and, and all these other things. It's, it's really overwhelming. And so it's natural that people are just going to feel lost very quickly. But it's like the way that I look at it, it's kind of like learning any language. Um, in the beginning, you're going to fall flat on your face and people will be there to, to help you say, oh, I think you meant to say this or is it meant to say that. And that happens to me because I'm not a practitioner. You know, like I'm learning all this as well, too. So I think it's it's really important to, um, to create a space where it's OK to make mistakes, where you have ample ways to get involved. And like you said, don't feel like you have to sprint into the repo to start attacking those issues. If you haven't watched a couple of videos, listened to a couple of meetings, read some posts, um, interacted with people and asked some questions. I think that's a really, really good point. Is like I said, it's just normal that young people are, are really, really very much in a hurry, um, but enjoy the process um, and also really enjoy the human side of it, of being able to meet people and, and learn from them. Love this. We I'm are, getting excited. Yeah, man. We, <laughs> and we only got four more minutes. We got four more minutes. <laughs> so now, now that we're getting towards the end is, uh, I don't know. I mean, like, you as a, you know, as someone who's, who's also seeing now the legal side of all this, could you maybe touch on that aspect of, of what, you know, you did mention a little bit in the beginning, but what kind of prompted the interest in, in the legal side of things, intellectual property? Um, what makes you passionate about that? And, and what do you hope to, uh, like, how do you hope to, to blend that into your career? Yeah, this is another good question. I, I saw this statistic recently and it was, you know, the number of people who, who have sort of legal based questions and this is this is more in general not specific to open source yet but the number of people who have legal questions in their life um, but don't have access to the knowledge to actually go and answer those questions and i think i fall into that same category myself i'm like okay you know i want to understand you know whatever the legal question is and and i sort of at the moment don't have a toolkit to to sort of analyze the question and, and understand what the problem is and and really you know, something that I've tried to do recently is think about the way that the laws exist sort of fundamentally the same way as computer science. And I think, you know, when you don't think about these things and when you don't have a, a deep understanding, um, it's magic. You know, you're like laws exist. You know, I just sort of follow them and I don't do bad things. And like, then my life goes on. But then you hear about all these things happening, lawsuits, Supreme Courts, all this stuff. And you're like, you know, I know that that happens, but it's unclear to me how it happens, what the impact is on my life. And I think technology and computer science is the same way until you have an understanding of what's happening, it's magic. Um, and really, I, I love the process for myself of learning computer science and, and just understanding the way that the world works better. Um, and now in open source, I, I see you know this, again, this sort of legal deficiency where you know, I, I've been deeply involved in the open source community for the last, you know, two years plus. And the number of like legal people who I know who also work in the open source, it's like zero. I don't know anyone who, who has like a deep legal understanding and is involved. Um, so I think having that, having that toolkit for myself will be, will be really helpful. And then being able to hopefully share that knowledge out with people uh, through whatever the medium is. And again, I'll, I'll make the disclaimer that um, I'm really early on in this journey, so I, I don't I don't know anything yet. Um, but I'm excited to learn and um, and see where sort of my my thinking and my understanding of these problems changes over time. I also, again, a sidebar is I think there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the open source licensing space. Um, I, I don't have all the the understanding and details, but 
you know, you see this in, in some of the conversations and news articles about, you know, some of the stuff that's happened with, with Amazon and some of their open source projects and, uh, or maybe not their open source projects, things like that. And I really just want to understand more and um, be able to, especially because open source is so fundamentally governed by licenses. Like that's the bedrock. Like if those licenses were gone, it would be a free for all. There would be, you know, you'd be able to do whatever you want and there would be no enforcement and things like that. So I, I really want to understand. I think that's a great point. And I think it's, it's something because uh, for a lot of young people out there, obviously open source provides so many outlets and, and, and ways to get involved and passion, and all that kind of stuff. But you have to understand as well is that if people want to live from this, there needs to be business models. And obviously licensing is one of them. There are different ways that these things can work, but without proper, you know, development and structure regarding that, the, the fact, I think it's a statistics that 90, statistic that 98% of open source, you know, projects fail. Um, perhaps, I don't know in how many cases, you know, a legal element that can relate to a financial element or, you know, scalability of a business um, that can definitely relate there. So there's very much a part to play. I think another thing to incorporate there, though, is background in computer science, end up shifting in into NASA, working at, you know, currently a very, very famous company now shifting into the legal space, just as a lesson to all the young people out there. Once again, what you're doing when you're 18 or 19 years old doesn't necessarily dictate what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. Keep your eyes open. I think also what you said earlier is finding that niche. How many lawyers will have you had your experience? Very few. And that's a beautiful thing. And so I think that everyone at the end of the day, as much as we feel like we're always normal and standard and run of the mill, is that this famous Steve Jobs, you know, speech of connecting the dots, which is really silly and it's cliche, but I think there's a lot to be said for that, is that what are the things that have made me the unique individual that I am, and how does that give me a competitive advantage in terms of finding that niche and what I bring to the table that nobody else can, because they don't have that unique mix of uh, factors. This is, of course, without even talking about, you know, different parts of, of the country where you've lived and things like that. We do have a couple of questions in the chat before we finish, so I want to get to them. So what, yeah. is the lear- what is the learning curve for somebody coming from Python and being relatively familiar with programming concepts? Um, maybe this was handled earlier, but like I said, in the context of, of Julia, someone coming from Python, is that learning curve steep? What would you say? Yeah, that should, it should be a real, relatively straightforward process. Again, syntactically, Julia was written to be very similar to Python, so should be, should be pretty simple. And um, again, I'd recommend checking out the learning resources and, and you should be able to see that from a syntax standpoint right away. Okay, good. I already linked, like I said, I linked stuff for Julia Academy and also Exorcism. So if folks want to check that out. And then also, what do you think is a good concept to get familiar with together with Julia where both strengthen uh, the other? Hmm. That's interesting. I, I think it would depend on, on what you mean by concept. Are we talking about like a field of, uh, of, some specific technology or like a, like a programming concept. I think if um, something that I've been on this personal journey with myself is uh, learning machine learning and, and learning about that through the context of, of Julia and, and really like trying to iron in on some of these fundamentals of machine learning and how those relate back to Julia. And I've sort of been using that as my Again, I want to learn sort of the deeper pieces of Julia because again, I've, I've been using the language. I'm not an expert. Um, I'm I'm a practitioner, but don't have all the understanding. So I've I've been trying to go on this parallel learning path with machine learning and and with Julia and, and seeing how much I can learn from from either or. And it's been awesome. It's just been such a fun opportunity. You can go look at my Stack Overflow. I'm I'm posting questions every day about you know how do I do this in Julia with with the machine learning package uh, Flux. So it's been a ton of fun for me. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, all right. Well, anyway, we got just got some more love in, in the comments here, Logan. That's pretty much all the time we got for today. But I think there's more than enough room to carry this on to a, to an, an additional session at some point. Uh, if not, organizing a panel, a very very exciting learning more about how Julia is providing direct results in the very uncertain world in which we live and helping reduce some of that uncertainty. So remember, at the end of the day, when we're talking about technologies, it's not just, you know, bells, whistles, and and code. This is directly impacting people's lives. So there should be a sort of a higher calling behind this, and all all of us can realize that that what we're doing, whether it's through non-technical contributions or technical contributions, or just being a friendly person who's proactive um, is really, really making a difference. Uh, So that being said, any final plugs or mentions you want to get out there, shout outs, anything like that before we finish? 
Yeah, Bart, I just want to thank you. I think this has been incredible. I think you're doing a bunch of awesome work um, in the data and Kubernetes community. So I, I appreciate what you're doing so much. And, and I think open source and the world needs more people who are like you, who are these ambassadors for communities and, and really helping push that forward. So um, thank you for, for the stuff that you're doing. Thanks for having me. And this was a ton of fun. So I appreciate it very much. Pleasure's all mine. I can't believe I get to do this stuff every day. So this is, this is <laughs> very much is living good. the dream. Life is yeah. good. Uh, Logan, thank you very much. We will definitely be talking to you soon. So take care and don't spend too much time in law school because we're going to need you for some more sessions. <laughs> all right. right. Take care. Take care.